Hundreds of years ago, a ship left the Black Sea en route to the Americas. Little did they know, they had a tiny hitchhiker on board who quickly jumped ship once they got to their destination. The zebra mussel had been introduced to North America. Native to the Black, Caspian and Azov Seas, the zebra mussel is a small freshwater mussel that is arguably one of the most successful invasive species ever. Once it's introduced to an area, it quickly outcompetes local organisms for oxygen and food. As an incredibly efficient filter feeder, it strips the water of nutrients, increasing water clarity and allowing sunlight in deeper, promoting the growth of tiny plants deep down which go on to decay and wash up on shorelines, foul beaches and generally degrade water quality. It sets up home on anything that's vaguely hard, be it other mussels or clams which are quickly overwhelmed, or man-made structures such as piers or even pipework that feeds freshwater treatment plants. They devastate local species and cause millions of dollars worth of damage to infrastructure. Of course, zebra mussels are just one example of an invasive species, but there are countless more. Chinese mitten crab, native to northern Asia, are an invasive species in Western Europe, the Baltic Sea and the west coast of North America. North American comb jellies, native to the eastern seaboard of the Americas, are invasive in the Black Azov and Caspian Seas. North Pacific sea stars native to the Northern Pacific are invasive in Southern Australia, and even less geospecific events like the ominous red tide, which is an algal bloom, is actually an invasive species from elsewhere. In their native environments, none of these species cause much of an issue because their populations are controlled by predators that have evolved over thousands of years to create a stable ecosystem. So how did they all manage to travel thousands of miles into new environments where they're free to take over because there are no natural predators? Well, just like the zebra mussel, all invasive species hitch a ride. It may not necessarily be on the hull of a ship anymore due to anti-fouling, but instead they travel within the ship in the ballast water that ships carry around the globe. With steel ships, when they discharge cargo, they often need to take on extra weight in the form of water ballast so that they're stable enough to head to sea. They take on water in the discharge port and carry it to the loading port where they pump it out as they take on their next cargo. Anything living in that water is set free in a brand new ecosystem. To try and put a stop to this, a relatively new international agreement is already in force and expanding in scope year on year, the Ballast Water Management Convention. Already, every ship has to conform to what's known as the D1 standard, which forces them to undertake ballast water exchange to be able to discharge ballast water in port. Essentially, they can only discharge water that's been taken on more than 200 miles away from land in water more than 200 meters deep. The theory is that there are fewer harmful organisms there that could overwhelm local populations. Of course, it's all very well saying that a ship needs to take on ballast in the middle of the ocean, but they still need to leave port with enough stability. So they undertake ballast water exchange out at sea. If you have enough stability, the simplest way is to pump out all the water in a tank and just refill it. If you do that a few times, you'll get rid of all the sediment and species that may be present in your ballast tanks. Of course, that only works if you have enough residual stability to empty tanks sequentially. If you don't, you need to adopt the flow through method where you pump in more water and let the tank just overflow, keeping it full the entire time. Theoretically, if you pump through one times the tank volume, you can achieve approximately 63% exchange. Twice the tank volume gives 86% exchange and so on, but you'll never quite reach 100%. Ballast water exchange, the D1 requirement, was introduced immediately for all ships as soon as the convention came into force. The stricter D2 standard is being introduced more gradually as it involves retrofitting existing ships with new equipment as they go to dry dock. D2 is actually a performance standard that specifies the maximum amount of viable organisms that are allowed to be discharged and essentially requires ships to have a ballast water treatment plant fitted. Treatment plants can use a variety of different technologies but broadly they all operate on a similar two-step principle. The first step is filtration, with the most simple being a screen that the water passes through, extracting all the larger organisms. In the second step, there are five methods that are commonly used. Chemical treatment, like chlorination, is the most common and cost-effective. Chlorine is easy to produce on board and it's created by hydrolysis of seawater due to the chlorine present in sodium chloride, or salt. Of course, you do need to add further chemicals to detoxify the ballast water before discharge as you can't go and pump out chlorine as it would just kill the local ecosystem instead. 
As an alternative to chemical treatment, you could consider UV treatment, which involves pumping ballast water past powerful UV lamps, which impacts on the DNA of organisms, rendering them non-viable so they can't reproduce. UV treatment depends heavily on the efficiency of the stage 1 filtration though, as sediments present in the water will obstruct UV light. The next option is deoxygenation, which involves blowing inert gas through the ballast tank to take all the oxygen out of the water. It takes a few days to complete and requires the tank to be completely sealed so that atmospheric oxygen doesn't get in. Deoxygenation is expensive, but it does have an additional benefit of reducing corrosion within the steel walls of ballast tanks. Alternatively, you could use heat treatment just like boiling water before you drink it. If you use your ballast water as cooling water for your engines, you're using waste heat as your treatment method. Unlike deoxygenation though, heating the ballast water can actually increase corrosion in ballast tanks, so it's not the most attractive method long term. The final method is ultrasonic treatment, which uses ultrasound energy to break down the cell walls of organisms within ballast water. It can be effective, but is also heavily reliant on a secondary method of treatment, such as filtration. As you can see, there is no universal solution to ballast water treatment, with different systems offering different advantages and disadvantages. Overall though, they all have the same objective eliminating even microscopic organisms within ballast water, bringing it within the limits of the D2 standard so that you're allowed to discharge with minimal danger to the environment. I say minimal because even the D2 standard doesn't require the complete removal of all organisms. It only requires fewer than 10 viable organisms greater than 50 micrometers per cubic meter and fewer than 10 that are between 10 and 50 micrometers per milliliter there is still plenty of scope for organisms to slip through the net. And that brings us to the end of today's video. To follow up, I recommend you next watch this one, where we take a look at anti-fouling on a ship and how it reduces the spread of organisms carried on the outside of a hull. Until next time, thank you for watching and goodbye.